Welcome everyone to part two of this webinar series. We're going to jump right in as I'm sure many of you are excited to learn more. Today, Melissa and Jennifer will share strategies you can implement from the clinical side. I'll hand it over to you both and kick us off in part two of this series. Thank you so much. Jen, it's so great to be back here with you. I hope that we have people come back for more after watching our first session and our other two dental dilemmas. <laughs> Yeah, we had a good time. We uh we solved a lot of dilemmas. So let's see if we can uh we can do that today. Well, for those that maybe didn't watch our first um, dental dilemma session, we'll do some quick introductions. Um, my name's Melissa Marquez. I am at Henry Shine One as the senior director of DSO Customer Solutions. <laughs> but prior to joining Henry Shine One, I had a long career in uh, dentistry and DSO. I spent 15 years at Dental One Partners in various operational roles from practice manager all the way to chief operating officer. Um, and then left to join a startup. And that was a great experience. So joined Jarvis Analytics that was later acquired by Henry Shine One. And that experience especially gave me so many different opportunities to work with all sizes of DSOs and emerging groups and um, have also loved getting to know Jennifer. So I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of intro yourself as well. Yeah, sounds good. So I'm Jennifer Stedman. I am Director of Operations for Inspired Hygiene. Um, and I also own uh, Stedman Onboarding Solutions. I like to you know, help practices just to find the right team. I know we actually talked about that on our, our first, we'll say dilemma, you know, part one. Um, <clears throat> and I have had almost every role in the dental practice other than a dentist, basically. <laughs> so I <laughs> started off as an assistant, then hygienist, um, practice manager, regional manager, <laughs> and kind of have grown since, you know, since there. So Previous um, to my role at Inspired Hygiene, I was director of operations of a 17 practice DSO in New England. Um, so had the amazing opportunity to have a great team and just to help to empower them and grow. Um, and it was, a, it was a huge learning experience. I know, Melissa, we kind of shared some stuff there too. So we have similar backgrounds. So just excited to be here today and to um, share some resources and uh, help some dilemmas. <laughs> Yeah, I think that'll be great. And um, Jen and I have had the pleasure of working together to present at different conferences, namely ADOM in the past together. And every time we talk, it's just, we have so many of the same like shared experiences and even in our personal lives, um, we have similar pets. Like <laughs> it's crazy. We've got so much in common, but we also have a lot of years of experience and we, I'm sure, um, I don't want to speak for you, Jen, but I know I've made plenty of mistakes in my time um, working at and with DSOs. And so I hope that as we get into these dilemmas, we can offer up some helpful advice to people that are maybe going through some similar challenges that we faced. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully people can learn from the mistakes that we've made, right? So just, <laughs> just here the, to, um, to help and uh, to learn more. So let's get started. Okay, so here's our first dilemma of the day. Dear Dental Dilemmas, I have had to hire two new hygienists that required a higher hourly rate than my previous hygienists. I'm struggling with helping them understand what is needed production-wise that will still allow us to have a profitable hygiene department. When I have tried to approach hygienists in the past, they have not wanted to look at their numbers at all, and the conversation goes south. What are the other groups doing to deal with all of the challenges we are experiencing in the hygiene staffing and limited PPO reimbursement? Yep. Uh. That's a lot of people are having that challenge right now, right? Um, hygiene is a big one, but really it's it's everyone, right? The, the increased hourly wages are very, very difficult. <clears throat> but hygiene as a provider um, is, is a challenge there. So uh, I've been there. I'm sure, Melissa, you have been too. Um, and we help clients at Inspired Hygiene all the time with this. So one of the things that I would recommend is, you know, really focus on patient care first because that's what's important right focus on patient care the you know the numbers will come obviously we need to make sure that we are profitable but patients are the number one so focus yeah. there first and look at some of those hygiene kpis that are patient care driven and not profitability driven right um so start there first and having a tool like jarvis to look at those and have your hygiene dashboard is amazing and your hygienist actually can go in there, they can look at what um, the patient care that they're providing, as well as the other hygienists, 
in, in the office and look and say, okay, what is, I'm just going to use some names here. There's no Sally on this call today, hopefully. So what <laughs> is, is Sally, Sally out there that's going to hear this? Then, <laughs> What is Sally doing that, that I am not doing? And mm -hmm. where can I do better to deliver that care to the patient? So focus on that first um, and really having that baseline for the team just to understand that because really yeah. we want hygiene compensation to be a three to one ratio, right? So mm -hmm. they should be producing three times as much as what their, um, what their salary is. So super, super important to have that. Um, and really one of the big ways to do that is to increase the procedure mix. You can't just do profies all day. Right. right. Your PPO, we're talking about, I'm kind of jumping around here. Your PPO reimbursements, they don't reimburse hardly anything for your profies. You're never going to be able to sustain your hygiene department doing that. So really understanding what other services that you can provide to your um, patients that is going to increase your standard of care in your practice yeah. is extremely important. Oh my gosh. There's just so much here. <laughs> I've got so many things running through my head. Like the first thing that I love that you said that I completely agree with is speaking their language. Like I have seen, um, mm -hmm. especially practice managers when they first dip their toe into like having provider meetings or looking at, you know, some of their KPIs will make the cardinal mistake of diving right into production. And that's mm -hmm. really not what speaks to a provider. Um, you said it, it's patient care. And I think also meeting them where they're at is really important. I had hygienists that loved and really viewed themselves as um, periodontal therapists. Like they really, they really understood perio. They were passionate about um, catching it and preventing it, educating patients on it, and even educating their doctors sometimes on it because they have more training actually than doctors often have in yep. perio. And mm -hmm. so- you know, you might have that type of hygienist that's going to be really receptive to looking at, you know, their period to profi ratio and are we doing five point assessments at a regular cadence? And they want to focus on those sort of leading measure KPIs. Um, but then you also have hygienists that are just really excellent at building relationships with their patients. They've got really high retention. Their patients love them. They never want to see anyone else. And they're also maybe really good at the adjunctives. They're, you know, they get really good acceptance on things like fluoride. So I think it's important to kind of know what's important to them as a provider and as a person, and then help them be rounded, just like you said, by looking at some of their patient care metrics and comparing to other providers. Sometimes it's just verbiage, especially around fluoride. I mean, we're not doing fluoride because insurance pays for it because <laughs> we know they don't. We're doing it because we know it prevents decay. So I think when they start, you know, when you allow them to have the time to look at the health history, make those connections back to what will be powerful for that patient, but also connect to what's important for them. You can make a lot of headway in that conversation. And they really trust you a lot more than if you're the numbers person that once a month sits down with them and talks about numbers. That's not fun for them. That's not why they became a hygienist. So I right. love um, that whole conversation and how you really, you know, you have to change your own delivery first and foremost. Right. And I think <clears throat> look, when we're talking about like service mix too, right, there's so much more than fluoride out there. Yeah. Right. There's other preventive products that um, there's a lot more that are emerging in the market now too. So it's okay. not just technology, it's different hygiene products that are out there that you can help to prevent disease and help to prevent decay on these patients. So super, super important to stay educated and know what's happening right now that you can help these patients too. <laughs> I think another thing that we're also seeing a lot more of is assisted hygiene. Now, um, yeah. I know at Inspired Hygiene, we talk about this a lot. We're doing some growth forums around it too, but with that, it's not assisted. There, there's two different, two different mindsets, right? It's assisted hygiene <clears throat> because we don't have a hygienist and we just need to, you know, we'll say turn and burn, right? We just got to get them in, get them out. Um, and then there's the other side that you're actually increasing the standard of care in your office by a, by doing assisted hygiene. Now think of it this way. This is a question that we had the other day. Can you do assisted hygiene in a very high end, we'll say bougie dental practice? Absolutely you can. Um, and you can actually do more things. If you have an assistant that's in their T 
taking the x-rays, going over things, you know, giving them a neck pillow or, you know, the, the warm hand towels and all of those other things that, um, by having another person to assist with that, having an assistant in there to help with that, you're increasing that care. You're increasing the patient experience on top of it. Um, and now you have a hygienist that has time to go in and educate and, you know, do the scaling or do, you know, SRP or preventive measures. Um, it's amazing to be able to do that. So not only are you delivering exceptional care and increasing just the patient experience on top of it, uh, you're going to get more referrals because of that too, right? There's so many other things, um, because you don't, dentistry is not transactional, right? It's, it's patient care and it's delivering that experience that people want. So, um, there's so many different things that you can do and just kind of threw that out there (laughs) in there too. So there's so many other things that you can help with. I think we talked about like the, the patient care metrics that are important that people measure and with team hygiene or assisted hygiene, I've seen practices, you know, focus on their production per day or per provider um, as, as a big benchmark or measure or goal that they have. I've seen practices go from like seven or 800 net dollars a day to 2,200 a day by implementing successful um, assisted hygiene. And another thing that changes with that is their overall production, because your hygienist is also your doctor's advocate, that patient, you know, they're looking at things and usually they're the first to see other issues, restorative opportunities, cosmetic opportunities. And if they're talking to the patient about what potentially could be happening before the doctor comes in your case acceptance just shoots up. So there's the other side of it that yes, you're looking at the hygiene production, but when you're short staffed and you don't have hygiene um, appointments available, you're missing out on the exam. And if you can add a hygienist who really does what we were talking about, helping you identify everything that's potentially happening with that patient, overall your metrics like case acceptance and production are going to shoot up in the practice. Absolutely. Absolutely. And think about it. If you have you know, your team hygiene approach and the assistant goes in and does like the tour of the mouth with the intraoral camera and takes all the x-rays. And then the hygienist comes in and looks at those with them. That also increases, you know, the visually who they are and what they're providing to your patients too, right? Because usually that's the doctor, right? The hygienist does it in the doctor. So it just, it increases, um, you know, the absolutely, like you said, the, the, um, the doctor case acceptance as well, but just the, um, empowering of that hygienist, my gosh. No, gosh, lots there. And (laughs) I know you're, you're the expert for sure in these areas, but I just, I just think there's, um, so much good we can do with patients at having these hygiene Mm -hmm. conversations. It might be, especially if you've brought in a new hygienist, the first time they've ever really looked at their own performance metrics. And so it is delicate, but, um, yeah, love the advice you gave. I think we should probably move on. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Number two, I'll read through this one. Uh, it's another sort of clinical type of dilemma here. It says, uh, I'm a clinical director at a mid-sized DSO emerging technologies are rapidly changing the field of dentistry, especially with the most recent discussions around artificial intelligence. I understand the need to be aware of these trends in order to stay ahead of the curve. And I'm interested in implementing this technology with our doctors. How can I address the concerns for my doctors that their diagnosis is being questioned? Also, what innovations should I be looking to implement and how can I get my providers to adopt them? So yeah, I was just thinking of AI in our last dilemma because you were mentioning those visuals and really showing them whether it's a scan of the mouth or, you know, going more old school with an intraoral camera photo, um, all of those things, you're really involving the patient in the exam. And I feel like this is taking that to the next level. Um, instead of sort of being a, a passenger in the exam, the patient's like co-pilot now because they're hearing, you know, we even have like a voice technology um, built into some of our practice management systems that allows when you're doing your five point assessment to hear the periodontal measurements being spoken out loud and recorded. And that, as we all know, involves the patient. They're listening and they're like, oh, she said a four or a five. That makes me worry. <laughs> Same with this, I think. Whenever we're using technology to help identify things sooner, 
Um, it can be uncomfortable for our providers, but it involves the patient in a way that I think it goes beyond like just another, you know, second opinion or a diagnosing tool. It becomes more of a patient education tool for sure. Have you had any experience with this, Jen, or have you heard, I'm sure you've heard about some of the new technology coming out. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, done, done a lot of research on the different ones out there. Um, I think the big thing with AI, especially from, you know, x-rays that tore the mouth that we were talking with hygiene is the human eye can only see so much, right? Mm -hmm. We see a lot, but being able to see things just when they're starting and to be able to prevent them from getting worse. How amazing is that for patients, right? Um, and just, you know, we see AI being used in all different parts of medicine right now. Um, so we knew de dental is on the way, right? It's, it's, yeah. um, it's here. So I think one of the things that, um, th that this, um, this letter here asks is, you know, how can we get our doctors kind of on board with this, right? Mm -hmm. To use it. And um, I think have them be part of it, have them be part of, you know, looking into and, you know, investigating the different AI softwares out there yeah. and have them be part of that. It's going to create some buy-in, right? Do different demos with different companies, um, and just see what's out there. Um, you don't want to just implement it and say, here, we're doing this, right? Yeah. You really need to get their buy-in. I think, the software that's out there right now, honestly, it speaks for itself. When you look at it, you're like, holy cow, I, I didn't see that. Yeah. It, I couldn't see it. So being able to have that tool and, you know, having your doctors look, look at an x-ray or look at an intraoral photo or, and seeing, seeing that, and then pairing it with like a periodontal chart and, you know, putting all of those pieces together oh my gosh, what an amazing tool to have the patient be involved in that. But to have your doctor see that too and see maybe what their diagnosis would have been based on their own eyes and then putting everything together on AI and seeing what, what it could have been. Right. Right. So um, being able to utilize something like that and having your doctors be involved in that process, I think is really going to help um, to be able to implement that a little bit smoother. You made a great point. I think I think the way to look at this is number one, be collaborative with your team, help them understand the whys. I think when, you know, <clears throat> sometimes when we're met with resistance on implementing new things, it's coming from fear. And if you can dig into the whys behind it, because they may be okay with implementing technology like this, but they may also be looking at their hygiene exams and thinking, how are we going to fit this another thing in, you know, so it may be a workflow or a time management concern. I think ultimately too, you just have to reinforce that they're the ones making the diagnosis and they should use this like they did any other tool, you know, with x-rays, for example, the tour of the mouth that you mentioned, um, photos. I also think it's important to re-impress with them, especially if they're, you know, compensated based off their net production or collections, which can both be impacted by um, the revenue cycle, that this also helps um, improve the time for insurance companies to pay. It's another fact that you're passing along to them that reinforces the care you've chosen to provide the patient. So I think there's so many reasons why you should look at this and should implement it. You can't let the concerns get in the way because it's coming, you know, whether we embrace it today or embrace it a year from now. One of the things that um, I think has been really interesting to learn, you know, we've partnered with Vidya Health to create um, and implement Detect AI um, integrated into our practice management system. So Dentrix or Dentrix Ascend. The reason it's different than some of the others that you see out there is that it's embedded into the workflow and you can stay in the practice management system, take your x-ray, have that image upload, and it's going to automatically overlay and apply the artificial intelligence. And so a lot of times when we introduce a new tool, it really is about like, how are we going to cram one more thing into this <laughs> appointment? This actually doing it this way improves the workflow and helps with the case um, presentation so that the old adage of a picture, you know, says a thousand words. It really does. I think when you are involving the patient that way and they can see it for their own eyes, 
Um, and like you said, medical has been using this for years over x-rays and over other types of imaging that they have to point things out that we can't see with our eyes. So it's coming, I think, in, involving your providers, talking about it, allaying those fears, involving them in the selection process, have a champion. You know, doctors tend to really look to each other for advice. And if they see one of their peers um, adopting it, being successful with it, um, they can really help you promote it above and beyond what maybe someone on the operations team can do. I think they just really respect the advice of their peers. And so leaning into that, I think would serve this person well as they're looking to kind of gain adoption. Awesome. All right. Well, I think our time's up. That's been our second dilemma. We're always looking for more <laughs> so we can do more of these in the future. It's It's been awesome to, to do this with you, Jenna. Hope we get more opportunities in the future to learn from um, individuals out there facing some of the current problems of today. Um, if they'd like to learn more, we wanted to share with the audience ways to get in contact with us. So I've got my email here, um, Jennifer's email, as well as a way to scan and request more information on anything we've talked about today. Um, but feel free to reach out, you know, if you have any other dilemmas or just want to learn more about one of the situations we discussed today or one of our technologies. Thanks, Jen. Well, thank well, thank you both for continuing to elevate this industry and helping us navigate through some of these challenges. So appreciate your time and expertise. Make sure you scan the QR code to learn more. And if you have any questions or would like to continue these conversations, don't hesitate to reach out to Melissa and Jennifer. They are incredible. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and have a wonderful day.